Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our oral medicine series. I want to spend some time talking about high blood pressure or hypertension in this video. We'll go over some guidelines to be aware of and how to manage it before, during, and after a dental procedure. So my goal here is if you see hypertension in a patient's medical history or an anti-hypertensive medication in their patient box, you'll know what to look out for on the board exam. So blood pressure is the force of blood pushing against the walls of blood vessels. Blood pressure is represented as two numbers measured in millimeters of mercury. The upper number or systolic blood pressure measures the pressure of blood when the heart beats after the ventricles contract. And the bottom number or diastolic blood pressure is when the heart rests between the beats. So you'd expect this number to be lower because that's when the heart is relaxing. Now untreated or uncontrolled hypertension, which is higher than normal blood pressure that stays consistently high, can cause a lot of systemic issues like stroke or heart attack or other end organ damage, including kidney failure and vision problems. So hypertension can be either acute or chronic. Acute hypertension is caused by some stimulus. This could be physical exertion, anxiety, or stress, and the blood pressure will usually normalize once that stimulus goes away. Chronic hypertension, however, is blood pressure that remains consistently higher than normal with or without a stimulus. And then white coat hypertension refers to blood pressure that's elevated when in a healthcare setting, but otherwise, it's completely normal. So it's a specific type of acute hypertension. And this tends to be more prevalent in older populations. So with that out of the way, let's review the meat and potatoes, which are the hypertension categories. Now as dentists, we're not diagnosing people with hypertension, which is done with two or more elevated measurements on two or more separate occasions, but we are recognizing a patient's current health status relative to these guidelines when they're sitting in the dental chair. So these are the newest ACC AHA guidelines from 2017, replacing the JNC7 guidelines that I used in a video several years ago. So we'll start with normal blood pressure, and this is defined as less than 120 systolic and less than 80 diastolic. And 120 over 80 was historically the perfect blood pressure to have. But technically, 120 over 80 would actually put you down here in stage one because of this new diastolic uh, rating. But anyway, let's continue. So elevated blood pressure is measured at systolic between 120 to 129, and diastolic still has to be below 80, so 79 or under. This is typically treated conservatively with a healthy lifestyle. Stage 1 hypertension is where systolic is between 130 to 139, or the diastolic is anywhere between 80 and 89. So this 80 to 89 is more typically going to get somebody into this category. That's a pretty low threshold uh, relative to historical categories. This is typically treated with one blood pressure lowering medication. Stage two hypertension is where systolic is 140 or higher, or the diastolic is at least 90. This one's treated with two uh, blood pressure lowering medications, typically from two different drug classes that we'll talk about later in the video. And then we have hypertensive crisis, where systolic is over 180 and or diastolic is over 120. So at this stage, the patient would need likely changes in medication or immediate hospitalization if there are signs of organ damage. And again, we'll talk about how to manage the specifics later in the video. So the diastolic reading is generally the more important one because again, it refers to when your heart is supposed to be relaxing. So if that number is high, then you know there's something going on there. And that's why the thresholds for diastolic are much more stringent. Also, compared to the old classification, these categories are just overall a bit more stringent, with some of these thresholds being lowered 
as I referred to before. So even though the exact cause of hypertension might be unclear, factors that contribute to its development include this following list. So obesity, smoking, lack of physical activity, a diet that's high in sodium or alcohol, uh, older age is a risk factor, familial history or genetics, pain can also increase the blood pressure acutely, uh, medications in including stimulants, decongestants, immunosuppressants, uh, corticosteroids, and oral contraceptives, and certain diseases like chronic kidney disease, hyperthyroidism, acromegaly, sleep apnea, and hypertension that's not associated with a, a specific systemic disease on this list is classified as essential or primary hypertension. So that's what I would include in those categories. While hypertension that has a specific identified cause like hyperthyroidism or some vascular disease is classified as secondary hypertension. Now 90 to 95 percent of cases will fall in this essential hypertension category due to something like high salt and water volume or something of that nature. So getting an accurate blood pressure reading is an important vital sign to record before dental procedures in order to help assess the patient's current health status. And not many dentists today use this manual method, but this is called the auscultatory method and it involves placing the cuff snugly around the patient's upper arm just above their elbow and using a stethoscope, not pictured here, to locate their brachial pulse. An oscillometric device enables the much more used automated method where the cuff inflates and it reads out the patient's measurement with the push of a button. So the AHA recommends arm cuffs as being more accurate than wrist, cuffs, and finger monitors. So when obtaining a blood pressure measurement in the dental office, you want the person being evaluated to kind of sit quietly and relax for at least five minutes in the chair with their feet flat on the floor. And you don't want to take a blood pressure measurement on someone who just ran from their car or walked up two flight of stairs to get to your office. You want them to be relaxed. And there are also various sizes for the blood pressure cuff, which is this black part. And you can use different sizes depending upon the age and size of the patient. And ideally, the length of the cuff, so when it's totally rolled out, that entire length should be at least 80% of the circumference of the upper arm, and the width of the cuff should be at least 40% the circumference of the upper arm. And this is important because the most common error in blood pressure measurement is the use of the wrong cuff size, usually too small. At the first visit, it's recommended to record blood pressure in both arms, and then you would use the arm that gives the higher reading for subsequent readings. You would separate repeated measurements by one to two minutes, and make sure you provide patients the blood pressure readings both verbally and in writing. So here's a list of some hypertension medications that you might see in a patient box. So a lot of these things I talked about in our pharmacology series, but we'll briefly go over the different categories here. So the alpha adrenergic blockers include the zosins, prozosin, doxazosin, and terazosin. And how these work is the alpha-1 receptor is responsible for vasoconstriction. So blocking that alpha-1 receptor will relax the vessel walls and decrease blood pressure by lowering total peripheral resistance. We also have an alpha adrenergic agonist, which is a bit confusing because you would think that would be the opposite of an alpha adrenergic blocker. And that's because the, well, the alpha two receptor is a little bit confusing. Basically agonizing this receptor in the central nervous system has a similar effect as the first row of drugs. And we don't have to get too much into that, but some of the examples of these drugs include clonidine, guanfacine, and methyl dopa. A direct vasodilators act directly 
on the smooth muscle cells of the vessel walls to open potassium channels and cause vasodilation, once again decreasing blood pressure by lowering resistance. The peripheral adrenergic inhibitors block the adrenergic receptors in an indirect way by messing with neurotransmitters that activate them, for instance. Beta adrenergic blockers, um, this works because the beta-1 receptor is responsible for activating heart contraction. So blocking that receptor will relax the heart and decrease blood pressure by lowering cardiac output. And then we have beta and alpha adrenergic blockers that kind of combine both of these mechanisms of action. The calcium channel blockers block calcium influx into smooth muscle cells at the vessel walls in order to cause vasodilation, similar to di direct vasodilators, just modulating a different ion. Instead of potassium, now we're modulating calcium. Diuretics block reabsorption of sodium in the kidney, which keeps more sodium and thus more water in the urine away from the blood. So it's decreasing blood volume, again, decreasing blood pressure. And then the last three here all work to block the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which naturally increases blood pressure. So blocking that system will decrease blood pressure. Again, it's important to evaluate vital signs like pulse and blood pressure at every dental visit because once you establish a baseline for a given patient, acute hypertension related to pain or anxiety can be identified, which is not as concerning as someone whose blood pressure is chronically high. It's also important to stay current with all of their medications. Now, a patient may not even be aware of what their medications are used for or consider themselves well controlled when, in fact, their hypertension is uncontrolled. So kind of like our gray area in antibiotic prophylaxis, we are once again at a bit of a gray area for how to manage hypertensive patients. And what I mean by that is there's a lack of published evidence and professionally accepted criteria to indicate a specific blood pressure elevation at which to defer or postpone treatment. There's basically a lot of disagreement. What number would we turn a patient away at? So incorporating the AHA and the ADA and the most validated sources I have, I came up with these guidelines. So anyone that is 120 over 80 or above with uncontrolled hypertension, we have a few guidelines that we need to follow. So short morning appointments are generally best since most people take their blood pressure medications either at bedtime or right in the morning. It's also good just to ask them, did you take your medication today? Stress management is also a good practice, but especially here for hypertension patients. Be kind and gentle, explain procedures and answer their questions. Consider a short-acting benzodiazepine before their appointment, or maybe even nitrous oxide during their appointment. Slow changes in the chair position are really important because some people with hypertension, especially older adults and diabetics, may experience orthostatic hypotension, which is a sharp drop in blood pressure when attempting to stand up after laying down, like in a dental chair, for a long time. So just gradually sit them up afterwards. And lastly, limiting epinephrine. So vasoconstrictors like epinephrine are rarely contraindicated because they help the anesthetic work. And pain is one of the things we want to minimize for this kind of patient. Pain could be contributing to their high blood pressure, so we want the anesthetic to do its job. What some people worry about, though, is cardiovascular stimulation with an inadvertent intravascular injection. So what we do is minimize the amount of epinephrine, we inject slowly, and we aspirate carefully and repeatedly to prevent rapid systemic absorption of that epinephrine. So 0 0.04 milligrams is typically our limit, and that's equal to one cartridge of anesthetic containing 1 to 50,000 epinephrine, two cartridges of anesthetic containing 1 to 100,000 epinephrine, 
or four cartridges of anesthetic containing one to 200,000 epinephrine. And due to the higher concentration of epinephrine in these impregnated retraction cords, their use has been discouraged in all people with uncontrolled hypertension. So those are some just good basic guidelines to follow for somebody with uncontrolled hypertension. Now when they hit this 160 over 100 threshold, so they, they're in the middle of that stage two hypertension, we want to follow a couple additional things. So do everything that we did up here with uh, two additions. So we want to retake their measurement in five minutes, perhaps in the other arm as well, and see if it lowers after some time just relaxing. Now some recommendations out there will say to defer treatment at this stage, but I'm going to go with what the AHA says. And at this level, we want to monitor their blood pressure throughout the procedure, namely an extraction or some other surgical procedure, about every 10 to 15 minutes to ensure that it doesn't climb to this next threshold down here. So that's for 160 over 100 and above. And lastly, for anyone at 180 over 120 or above, they're considered to be in hypertensive crisis. So what you do depends on what you have planned for that day and the intricacies of that patient's health status. So if you're doing an elective procedure, let's say an aesthetic composite restoration, then we would defer treatment to another day. It's not necessary to have them treated. If you're doing an urgent procedure, however, an extraction of an infected tooth, maybe they're in a lot of pain and their blood pressure is higher than usual because of that. So now we have to consider, are they asymptomatic or symptomatic for end organ damage? Remember, that's what we're really concerned about in a high blood pressure patient. So asymptomatic hypertensive crisis is called hypertensive urgency and symptomatic is called hypertensive emergency. So symptoms that we're looking for include altered mental status, blurred vision, chest pain, difficulty breathing, dizziness, and numbness in the extremities. If there are no symptoms, ideally we would call their physician before proceeding if possible, and then we could consider some conservative emergency dental care if there's pain, infection, bleeding, or swelling. Just giving them local anesthetic could decrease their pain and blood pressure, and it might give them enough time to start taking an antibiotic and get medical help. Or incising and draining an abscess can relieve pressure and expedite healing while being relatively quick. After the conservative treatment is completed, we want to make sure that they see and follow up with their doctor. Now, if they're symptomatic, then we are immediately referring them to the emergency room, to the hospital, where they could administer IV blood pressure medication, IV antibiotics, etc. So I really like these guidelines. It's what I use in practice. But like I said, there's a bit of a gray area here. Some patients may have written guidance or clearance from their physician accepting a higher than normal blood pressure. And if that's the case, you can proceed. But on the other hand, you have to consider comorbidities in making the decision to continue with dental treatment since we're most concerned about stroke or heart attack when their blood pressure is high. So we have to consider, are they obese, a diabetic, smoker, do they have high cholesterol, older age, reduced functional capacity? All of those things may tip the scales away from doing any sort of dental treatment and getting them in the hands of a physician. So the bottom line is, guidelines like these are great, but don't automatically defer a patient just because their readings are high. Definitely analyze their medical history, their past vital signs, get a full picture, and get their physician involved as soon as possible. So the last thing we have to talk about are oral manifestations. And the spoiler is that there are no true oral manifestations of hypertension but there are several possible side effects from the medications used to treat hypertension, and that's what we'll talk about in this slide. So most classes of antihypertensive medications that we just talked about can cause xerostomia or dry mouth, as well as taste changes and ulcerations 
that are a consequence of dry mouth. These symptoms can be addressed by frequent sips of water, using a biotin rinse, and other things to manage dry mouth. Calcium channel blockers, one of those antihypertensive categories, can cause drug-induced gingival enlargement or gingival hyperplasia. Nifedipine is the most likely one to cause this reaction. Gingival hyperplasia can be treated surgically to temporarily remove the overgrowth, but recurrence is likely unless the causative drug is discontinued. Angioedema, which is rapid swelling beneath the skin or mucosa, usually presents as big puffy lips, can be caused by renin angiotensin aldosterone system blockers. So this includes those ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin II receptor blockers, and the direct renin inhibitors. Those were those three bottom rows in our chart. And then lastly, excessive gingival bleeding is possible due to the vasodilatory effect of direct vasodilators like hydralazine. All right, so that's it for this video on hypertension. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.